have a lot of time for Q&A, uh, and also won't just drone on like I kind of did last time. So anyway, um, so tonight we're looking at the prayer book, and then we've only, this is the fourth class of eight, so we're halfway after this one. Imagine that. Um, next week we'll talk about the church, the Anglican Communion, Episcopal Beliefs, um, which is sort of a catch-all for a lot of different things. And then there's a sort of final session where we'll kind of wrap up some things um, in this group. And then the last final session, which will be the Wednesday in the week preceding Thanksgiving, not the day before Thanksgiving, um, there'll be a guided tour of the church and the ins an instructed Eucharist. Some of the stuff we'll talk about tonight, if you remember from the reading, um, kind of goes through like your average Sunday service and the different parts. So in some ways, and when we get to that part tonight, that'll kind of be a precursor for the last session where we'll actually do it as we talk. Um, so that's kind of the, the thinking. You may have noticed walking in uh, that there were sort of like 20-ish high schoolers next door. So the first of their confirmation preparation classes are happening uh, their, their presentations. They're talking about baptism tonight. So they're over there. I heard a, a couple teenagers uh, screaming about pimples in the bathroom. <laughs> so we're getting back to some normalcy at St. Stephen's in that regard. Um, but they will join us for that last session because uh, we're sort of all on the same path. Um, and that, that leads me to another important part. Y you all will remember when we started this, we talked about I talked a little bit about confirmation last week um, and that that will, that this course can serve as a sort of preparatory piece for anyone who might want to um, take that sort of step. Um, one thing we emphasize here is that um, you do not need to be confirmed to be a member. These terms sort of all get sort of conflated together. Um, but but we generally encourage folks, if they're not confirmed, to consider it because it's just an opportunity to sort of be part of the fullness of this tradition. So if you were, and if you were confirmed in the Roman Catholic Church, um, then generally we, or, or the Lutheran Church, we, we sort of receive your confirmation. So you're received, not confirmed. Um, it's, it's a little, one of these ways that we try to work out um, what tradition you're coming from and honoring that, just like we talked about last week where, you know, we don't re-baptize people because you're not baptized as like a Roman Catholic or an Episcopalian. Um, but confirmation and those sort of steps are where, in some ways, where does that baptism get lived out and what kind of tradition is kind of how. So therefore, we had this conversation where I misspoke and mis did not say the correct uh, standing of the Roman Catholic Church about Eucharist and all, which really is about confirmed Catholics, not baptized Roman Catholics. Um, so I've already apologized for that in my email, but yikes, um, we all make mistakes. Um, but, uh, but that's, some of you are taking this course, you've already indicated on the form that you might want to pursue that. Um, I, again, would encourage you, I'm, I probably will follow up with everyone who clicked that mark, but again, some of you, we already have uh, coffee dates set up or working on them, uh, but invite you uh, just, we're not that big. If every, anyone wants to visit, um, I'm not that popular. My calendar gets kind of full, but we look two or three weeks out. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of space every, um, and just would love to get to know everyone too. It's not just about the specifics, about confirmation and the like. Um, so any, um, let me, I'm going to say a prayer, and then uh, we'll, we'll, I'll start with just a little bit of comments about last week, if there are any questions, and then we'll get into this stuff. Um, but as we do, because there's a lot of me talking, I would invite you all to open the prayer. We're going to look at the prayer book a lot, so find the prayer book in front of you. And yeah, so let's, if you turn it to page 280... And uh, this prayer shows up on Good Friday. It shows up on East, the Easter Vigil, lots of places, but this is just one place where it shows up. Um, 
So it's that prayer on the bottom left page of 280. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's a collect for the church, um, but I thought we might pray this together, um, and then I'll, I'll say a few things about it. So um, you can just kind of follow my pacing. It's kind of a long one. So let us pray. O oh God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So that's one of my favorite prayers in the prayer book, and um, I think it it encapsulates well at the heart of it what the church is about. Um, lots of the stuff that we talk about, particularly in this course, can get somewhat technical, somewhat, I don't want to say churchy, because everything we're talking about is churchy, but, um, uh, but sometimes we can forget the, the, the purpose, the ultimate purpose of all of this. And ultimately, the church in every age, and some of what we'll talk about is some church history things here, is about... Um, carrying out, and some of the language here is obviously sort of not how we would maybe talk now, but that's part of the richness of our tradition is uh, we didn't come up with it yesterday. Um, but one of the principles we'll talk about tonight is how um, the Protestant Reformation, but particularly the Anglican way, is about um, having liturgy, worship, the Bible, prayers, and the language understand it of the people or by the people, and that's a principle that guides us throughout the centuries. Um, but we're always in the mission of carrying out in this time sort of the plan of salvation or making the world whole again. Um, and that has everything to do with, um, with raising up everything in the world which has been cast down, and everyone in the world who's been cast down. And um, making new all things that had grown old. Um, all of this being done through the person of Jesus Christ. Um, and, and that, I have a personal story for you just about that this is a prayer that um, is at every ordination because it's sort of what does the church do? The, the raising up of people to serve the church in all kinds of orders, but particularly ordained people. Um, and I have an experience, I preached about it a long time ago, over a year ago now, of hearing this prayer at a time of my life. Uh, I was ordained a deacon in December of 2014, so coming up on seven years, um, when I had a recalling an experience in which um, someone had hurt me, uh, betrayed my trust, and I had an experience of, of hearing this, the bishop who ordained me say this prayer at a time in my life when um, I sort of had an experience of grace, of how my life, um, that things that had been cast down, that I had been cast down, were being raised up, that old things, old wounds in my life were being healed. And I always think it's important for us not to forget that that's at the heart of all that we do here. It's why, it's why we do work in the world in outreach. It's not just because we're looking to be good people, which is good and fine, but there are plenty of good people and organizations that do good. We do good particularly for a particular reason and for a particular purpose. Um, so all that we're going to talk about tonight about the prayer book and liturgy and worship, I just think it's helpful to have this as our guide. This is our sort of north star of guiding us into all of these things. I also just want to pause. Are there any sort of things from last week? Questions, wonderings, further clarifications before we sort of move ahead? Going once.
going twice. Okay. There's a, a couple of your uh, questions, your note cards. I've, I've kept, take these. I took these to Shrinemont where I was earlier this week. Um, and we'll get into a couple of these that are relevant to the church and to the prayer book particularly. Um, so uh, the reading we talked about um, the Book of Common Prayer and how it was formed. Um, and again, I'm just going to read a couple times tonight. I'm going to read from the reading just because it helps set the scene. And if I had like a PowerPoint, I could be like, see, look here, but we don't have that, obviously. Um, so I'm just going to read this. Um, the result was the 1549 Book of Common Prayer, a remarkable and groundbreaking work that was in English, not Latin, reflecting his desire, this is Thomas Cramner, the author of this, the Archbishop of Canterbury, that the services of the church be in a language, quote, understanded by the people. So this is one of the principles, uh, and again, trying to sum up the Protestant Reformation in, in, in half an hour is a dangerous thing. Um, but one of the the sort of principal parts of the Reformation, which happened in the sort of the 16th century, as you see, in the 1500s, is about um, through lots of varying diverse people and parts of Europe, frankly, um, of people coming to an awareness um, through theological ways, but also totally secular ways, like the we all remember from history class, this is when the printing press is invented. So our ability to distribute things and um, people's literacy rates rising um, mean that certain things can be communicated so much faster and uh, wider than before. And so people started to question, why do we need um, people like me, frankly, clergy, interpreting things for other people? Um, and uh, this is sort of a, a weird bastardization of church history in like 10 minutes, but, um, but lots of different movements affront to say um, that the liturgy, the, the service of the church, um, need not be in a language that no one understands. No one, no one spoke Latin, and very few people read Latin, and so if the entire liturgy is in that, and no scripture was in English or French or German, or the language of the people in the vernacular is what, uh, is at the root of it. And reformers in different parts, we're going to focus on England, but in different parts of, uh, of Europe, different strands of what would become Protestant churches, the Lutheran tradition, the Calvinist tradition, um, all kinds of others that came from that over time, had different Zwingli, Calvin, other of these big luminaries thinkers at the time who are emphasizing different parts of the need for reform. And like any part of human history, there are folks who are more moderate and folks who are kind of more radical. Um, and really the, an emphasis, as I've said before, of the Anglican perspective is trying, even within the England, there were those sort of way on the uh, anti-Roman Catholic side and others who wanted just sort of small reform or just to reform the church within. Um, and that mixed with politics uh, leads to somewhat of where we came. This is always where I say again, you know, there still is no separation of church and state in the United Kingdom to this day. And the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, which we'll talk about, which is like the third iteration from the beginning, um, is still the official prayer book of the Church of England. Uh, not something written 50 years ago, but something written 350 years ago in a country that's mainly secular, but there was a movement in Parliament in the Church of England for them to shift to like a more modern version, and it was defeated. Because, you know, some things have staying power, even if we're not really going to church anymore. So it's a fascinating thing. Um, the reading, the, the, the real principle I want to talk about here is this notion of having the liturgy, worship, scripture uh, closer to the people in a language understanded by the people. Um, the, the thinking there, of course, is this is also part of a, of a movement scholarly at the time of recovering ancient sources and getting back to sort of the ad fontes moment, movement, this getting back to the original 
different studies of different languages were coming back um, and folks realizing that, again, like a game of telephone, you get away from the original language and then a version, a version, a version, and things have started to be interpreted a certain way, you know, that fits certain political and other agendas. And you get back to the basics, you know, the, the first line of that telephone game, you start, actually, it meant this, but boom, 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 boom. I mean, it's, you know, it's not like Jesus was turned into a different person, but certain things were emphasized. And I dare say, you know, his critique of empire was less emphasized. Let's just put it that way. Um, because the church had become pretty much an institute of, of political establishment and the like in certain countries. So that, that's, I'm not in any way pretending to be church history in 10 minutes, but that's just a little bit of a summary for all of us. But it's, it's a really important principle because um, it sets up all of the rest of uh, what liturgy is supposed to be. The, the reading later on talks about that liturgy is really just another way of saying the work of the people uh, or the works of the people. And so all that we do in worship is about all of us participating in something that gives glory to God, but also is where we place our worth. That's what worship is about. We, where, do, where, where, where do we put and where do we orient ourselves? Again, that notion of like when all the priests was facing that way. Um, we're ultimately worshiping not ourselves, but God. And we're placing our, our worth, what we value. Uh, in the person of Jesus Christ in our understanding of who God is. But the principle of having language understood by the people um, is something that Thomas Cramner wrote about in the 16th century that still guides us today and guides other people too. It's not just Episcopalians. But that's why, because what is, can the people understand it? It's an old way of saying it. Um, we obviously are not in the same world as uh, the mid-16th century, are we? We're also not in the world of 1979, where our prayer book, the new prayer book, as I've said before, just like in 1928, it was uh, not the world of the mid-19th century. That was new. So what's old, what's, things are always pushing. So it's, this is not some modern, you know, lefty, liberal agenda to have prayer book revision, um, but it's it's saying again and again, do we understand the people of God who live in different times? Do we understand, is this intelligible to us? Is how we talk about God intelligible with what we understand now? But also like, you know, any, any, we all have glasses through which we see the world and our need to continually to look at what God's doing and how we bring biases to it, you know, Everyone brings a bias to reading of a text or anything, um, no matter how woke or objective you might be. No one is purely objective. So all of us bring our understanding of culture, society, who God is, to how we pray. And the reading talks about that, how it, um, later on one of the principles is that the Episcopal Church was forming, whereas other traditions would say, we're... Methodists because we believe in these 10 things or different confessions that are brought up, Augsburg Confession, others and the like. And we say we're, we have unity because we, we hold to these things. The Episcopalians, again, we have essentials that we hold to, but generally stressed, um, again, if you want to know who Episcopalians are, pray with us. We're united by our common prayer, by enabling a community to pray together um, instead of saying, because of course, the, if you say it's sort of these 10 things, then there'll be people who say, well, I like nine of them, <laughs> not 10. So then this is where splits start coming from that. And we've had plenty of splits in the Episcopal Church, but it's actually led to a little bit more unity because we're, we're, we're actually not united in saying all the same um, believing all the same things, but having a common way of praying together, of moving throughout uh, the ages, if you will. Um, so I talked about the 1662 prayer book, um, which is still the official book in the Church of England, um, which is an interesting thing. 
Um, the reading talks about, again, that this is a sign of unity for all of us. Um, and then the reading talks about uh, why are there different versions of the prayer book in different countries. So again, a little reminder of church history that the Episcopal Church uh, in the United States was the outgrowth of uh, Anglican churches, churches from the Church of England, usually through colonialist means, almost always, evangelizing around the world, including the United States, um, then led to, you know, we had a little war with England in the late 18th century. Um, and so uh, as the state church, uh, clergy, Anglican Church of the United States would have to swear allegiance to the queen. Well, that gets a little cumbersome when you're fighting a war against the queen. And so that's how the first Com Book of Common Prayer in the United States comes out of that. And it's largely the same. You just sort of change queen to state uh, and because it's largely the same sort of tradition. Um, but that leading around, we'll talk about this more next week, about all these different churches that have roots in the Church of England through missionaries as the British Empire went around the world with all of the pros and mostly cons of that work. The vestiges of that are communities were formed, people began to come to know who Jesus was, be baptized, start churches, and uh, over time the British Empire starts to fall. Countries gain independence, but the country might gain independence, but they don't want to stop praying how they prayed, and this is how we get all of the different churches around the world that have roots in the Church of England, parts of this thing called the Anglican Communion, of which we are a part here in the Episcopal Church. But, um, but an interesting thing, again, is that principle of Cramner from the you know, mid-16th century. Um, so language understanded by the people means something very different in New Zealand, which is where the reading talks about the New Zealand prayer book, uh, which looks like this. It's red. Some of you may, um, we may, I think next week I'm going to print out copies for us to pray night prayer, which is Compline in the New Zealand Book of Common Prayer. But again, um, the same principles thought up by a, you know, European white guy uh, in the mid-16th century is why it makes sense for New Zealanders to have a prayer book that sounds different than ours. Because the people are in a different cultural context than Americans or people in England in the mid-16th century. And uh, what's going to be understood by them? It wouldn't make sense for us to pretend that everyone in the world sort of speaks English. This is not, you know, this is, this is nothing, the, the Protestant movement wasn't about making everything in English, taking it from Latin, which no one spoke, but it was saying in the language of the people, in the vernacular. And uh, this is how you have all different kinds of people all over the world worshiping uh, in the Christian traditions that speak all different languages. And this is why the Episcopal Church in this very diocese of Virginia, we have communities that's, that pray in Spanish, in Chinese, in Korean, in uh, French in a few places with uh, Haitian backgrounds. Um, and this is the, the sign of unity because we're praying the same words even if they're not in the same language. This is sort of like the Acts of the Apostles story when all the Holy Spirit descends on Pentecost and everyone is speaking in different languages, but everyone is intelligible because they have the gift of being able to discern that. So it's not about everyone speaking the same language, but about everyone understanding one another in their own language. So it's, a, it's kind of a radical principle. Um, so it's just interesting. I'll just give you a taste for... Um, so let me, uh, I'm just going to do a little comparison for what things sound like in the uh, 1979 prayer book and what they sound like in the New Zealand uh, Book of Common Prayer. So it's just a fun exercise here. So I'm going to read the Song of Simeon, which comes in, uh, well, morning and evening prayer, mostly in evening prayer. Let me find that. And just, you can listen to how it sounds different. Um, so this is the Song of Simeon from the Book of Common Prayer. Lord, you, have set, you now have set your servant free 
to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see, a light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. And this is the translation of this in the language understood by the people in the New Zealand prayer book. Praise be to God. I have lived to see this day. God's promise is fulfilled and my duty done. At last you have given me peace, for I have seen with my own eyes the salvation you have prepared for all nations, a light to the world in its darkness and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to God, sustaining, redeeming, sanctifying, as in the beginning, so now, and forever. Amen. You can see the difference there. Um, it's uh, ancient words. These, these words come from uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. This is when Simeon um, is uh, holding the, the, um, the one who is uh, going to lead to salvation in, in his arms and saying, look, here, here, is, the, here is the salvation. My, my work is done. Um, and this is also a way in which we um, speak more about what, what do we mean when we say glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Three parts of the Trinity, one God, not exactly a simple thing to understand. Glory be to God, sustaining, redeeming, and sanctifying. Those are attributes of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the, this is a way, you know, this is not an attempt to just have gender neutral language, but it's a way to speak about the elements of what we believe about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit that don't actually have gendered language. It's not about being progressive, it's about being kind of, God the Father is about the creating aspect of God. Um, God the Son is about the redemption, the redeeming aspect of God. And the Holy Spirit is that which sanctifies, which gives life in the world now to God. And uh, so sometimes we, other parts of the communion can help us understand things for ourselves in a, in a new way. Any questions about any of that? Wonderings? Comments? It's pretty. Yeah, it is pretty. We, we are, you know, um, w there's no, like, agenda here, but we are wondering about using a few more uh, prayers in, like, the Celtic service from night prayer because it, it actually is, it's, it's sort of in the style and vein, but it's also, like, a Anglican. Like, it's other, and lots of what we use in the Celtic service are prayers adapted from different resources, uh, but this is, this is one that we also could use, uh, which is really pretty um, and just like anything, it, it's, it's these all uh, emphasize different parts of who God is. And, and I always like to think of it as sort of um, all kinds of ways of thinking about God, not one being better or worse. Um, and like what we do here at St. Stephen's, like we have an eight o'clock service that happens over here that has, you know, it is very meet and right so to do. It is our loud, you know, um, right one language, which really comes from the 1928 prayer book and the 1662 prayer book before that. Um, and then we have the Celtic service, which has kind of pretty expansive language and language uh, at the 9, 11, 15 services that are sort of more kind of straight down the line of traditional Episcopalian in the 1979 prayer book. And we have all of that here, as opposed to sort of saying one or the other um, and how all of those different types of people praying, how you have unity, is not um, uncomplicated, uh, but it's actually a very Anglican way of looking at it because we have all of those, uh, I think, um, it's all of that language is understood by the people uh, who worship there. And some people will tell me that they, people who are Celtic people, if you will, who find themselves because, I don't know, they have to go out of town or something at an 8 o'clock service, they might say, ooh, this is a little, little different emphasis. But some people really come to love that in addition to Celtic, and the opposite is true. Um, 
Um, and I, I, that's always one of the cooler moments when people talk to me about how, you know, my mind was expanded, whether it was I only thought right one was the only way and that Celtic service actually has some merit, or it's the Celtic service, you know, I might be maybe a little more on the fringe or on the margins and yet come to appreciate the goodness involved in an 8, 8 a.m. service. Um, and so those aren't sort of antagonistic, but part of a community together. So, um, any other questions, wonderings? 7.05, so we'll, um, we'll go forward. The next section um, is about the sort of Sunday service. So for this, I'm going to invite you to open your prayer book to page 355. And I'm going to kind of walk us through different parts of that. So I'm just going to use this as kind of, again, we'll do some of this in, at the last session, but I thought it'd be helpful to, to look at the actual book. And I should, I should tell you all, um, the, uh, if, you, if you have a book of common prayer, I invite you to bring that to class from now on just because you can look at it. Um, if you don't, um, I would love to use my extremely rich discretionary fund to buy you one. They're not very expensive. It's not extremely rich. I'm being funny. But they don't cost very much. Um, so if you'd like to, I just think it's cool to have one. Um, we have lots around here for various things. So just come up to me after class and we can talk about that. Get you one if you'd like one. Or you can buy one. They're not very much money on Amazon. Get your own version. Sometimes people ask me, like, if they're different sizes, does that mean they, the pages are different? No, they're the same. <laughs> Um, but just get a, one that's the 1979 Book of Common Prayer. Um, it's, it's, a good, it's a good investment um, to, to have on your bedside table or somewhere in your house. Um, so the question in the reading is, how does the liturgy work in a tip, tip, typical service of Holy Eucharist, which 99% of the time is the service now that you'll find in an Episcopal church um, every Every service we do at St. Stephen's on an average Sunday is Eucharist except Compline, which is totally sung. So any, any service that has congregational participation, you'll, you'll get um, things like morning prayer during the week, Monday through Friday, um, which we can look at as well. Those also have an opportunity to receive Eucharist kind of after the fact, so it's sort of like a Eucharist, even though we don't consecrate stuff. Um, but besides, like, the Thanksgiving Day service and some other things we do, pretty much everything now uh, will be a Eucharistic service, which, again, is part of that return in the 1979 prayer book to the two main sacraments of Jesus' day that we interpret from his life, baptism and Eucharist. Um, but I know there was a time, and I keep looking at Leslie as, like, you weren't here, you didn't get here yesterday, um, that there was a time not that long ago in which certain services here every Sunday or more Sundays than not were morning prayer. Um, it is beautiful. It is. And, and, and I, I do think there are opportunities for us to get people to see that that aren't Monday at 8, 10 a.m. when, you know, is not my ideal time of day. Uh, I, have to, I have to lead morning prayer about once a week, but it's, it's rough sometimes. But I'm not, not, not my best at 8, 10 in the morning. Anyway. So uh, the reading talks about um, how liturgy is translated as the work of the people, where we put our worth, um, where we put our due worth, our worth-ship. Uh, so all that we're doing in worship is reminding ourselves uh, that God is God and, and we are not, actually. That's, that's a good reminder. Um, and that we're kind of orienting ourselves to what, towards what really matters in life. The reading talks about um, that the service starts with a recognition of the season in the church calendar that we're observing. And then it, there are terms like Advent, um, Easter, um, Christmas, Epiphany. And I just I want to read this because it, it's kind of easier for it, me just to read it and then talk about it. 
And this, as you'll see on this page 355, so it says, you know, in, in the above, from Easter day through the day of Pentecost in Lent and other penitential seasons, so from the very first words of a liturgy, we're making a signal about where we are in the life of the liturgical year, which really, very simply put, is just about following the life of Jesus. Um, and we'll talk about that in a sec. Advent is the season of preparation, both for the, coming of, for the first coming of Christ, but also for the second. So the first in the manger, the second sort of at the end of time, which is not an uncomplicated thing to think about, but we'll talk about that. Uh, Christmas is the moment when we receive the incredible truth that God became a vulnerable baby, dependent on a teenage mother. And this is where I remind people that Christmas is not just a day, but it's a season of how many days? Twelve days of Christmas, my true love, baby. There you go, twelve, exactly. Um, this is, you know, where there are already Christmas trees at Costco, and it's October, whatever it is. And then the day after Christmas, it's like Christmas is over. And we're like, no, it's 12 days. And we fight that fight and all. But anyway. Um, Epiphany uh, is when we recognize how the light of Christ is available to the whole world. The Feast of the Epiphany, which is when we say that the wise men showed up at Jesus on January 6th. Uh, They weren't actually there on Christmas Eve. Talk about all those scriptures and all. Um, Lent. Um, and so and an epiphany is sort of that season where the light of Christ is um, sort of seen for the first time and then starts to be made known around the world. So all the stories that you'll hear in Scripture then are about Jesus, sort of his beginning ministry, going out into the world, his baptism right around epiphany. And then uh, sort of you get Jesus for not that long, sort of going out and about, ministering, becoming known, healing and the like. And then uh, Lent starts, which is this journey, uh, it talks, Lent is the start of the journey into adulthood and reaches a climax in the tragedy of Good Friday and Holy Week. So this is where we're, we spend 40 days preparing uh, for those, that holiest week of the year in which Jesus rides into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday as the king of the Jews who's going to sort of redeem Israel, and then it doesn't exactly go as expected. Um, and then we get Monday, Thursday, where he washes the disciples' feet and says, um, on the night before he was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, and gave them this gift of how to remember him when he's not around. Good Friday, dies, is crucified, and then on the third day, three days later, rises on, on early on the first day of the week, as the, the reading says. Um, so... Lent is a season preparing for that, and then Easter is a 50-day 50 50 day season in which we sort of tell all these stories about the resurrection and how that changes the world kind of forever. And then um, the season sort of after Pentecost, which is what we kind of call ordinary time, which sort of goes on and on and on and on and on. Even now, it's green. Uh, That's the liturgical color, which have, corresponds to some of these seasons. Um, but the point for this part is, is not necessarily to talk about the liturgical year, but to say at the very beginning of a service, you get a sort of marker of where we are. So generally, this blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a way of saying, uh, acknowledging uh, that, that God is really in charge of this thing that we're doing. And uh, we emphasize that differently depending on the season. So... Um, it says from Easter day through the day of Pentecost, that would be a really celebratory time. So we say, Alleluia, Christ is risen. We emphasize that bit. In Lent, where um, technically the other penitential occasions technically could be Advent. We talk about Advent as a little Lent because we're sort of preparing for this gift of Christmas, like we're preparing in Lent for the gift of Easter. Sometimes we emphasize that a little less around here, but, um, but Advent, both of those as seasons of preparation. Then we say that prayer that we began class with that first day, the College for Purity. Um, and then there's some opening prayers um, about where we are in the life of the church. 
Then the reading talks about. So seasons and colors is sort of your first thing. I have it as A on my notes here. Um, B is uh, the word. And the reading here talks about, next we move to the word part of the service. This is a section where we learn about who God is. Christians believe God has told us or revealed to us who God is. We learn through the written word, which is the Bible, readings from Scripture, the eternal word, that we read those in Christ, and then the proclaimed word, which is through the preacher. So you'll see here, page 357 um, through 358 um, is uh, where we read different parts of Scripture. Um, and that could be one or two lessons as appointed or read. Um, and then uh, a psalm, which is another piece of Scripture. The reading later talks about something called the Revised Common Lectionary, which is how the schedule of readings, how we and the Roman Catholics, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, Disciples of Christ, UCC folks, all read uh, with almost all, they might read different translations, but they read the same, if they follow the Revised Common Lectionary, they read the same readings, uh, the same stories of Scripture every Sunday. So one of the signs of church unity. Not every Protestant denomination uses the RCL, but a lot do. Um, the church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, which is the, m the largest Lutheran tradition. I know, uh, Richard, I think you asked a question about our relationship with the Lutherans. Um, there's actually, it's weird, it was on, during like a YouTube wormhole that I was on like a week ago. Uh, there's actually a really cool video about how the ELCA took like like three different, four different Lutheran churches in like the 60s and 70s, y'all are Lutherans back there, and, and came in to form the ELCA and the history of that. Um, I'm not a Lutheran expert by any stretch, but the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and the Episcopal Church, we're kind of bouncing around here, are in a full communion partnership now, which means uh, that we on all of the essentials agree um, and we actually um, can share clergy so i could go be the the pastor uh, of a luther alca congregation bishops have to approve these things because you know they need stuff to do i guess but um and then a lutheran pastor like technically a lutheran clergy person would be qualified to be the next rector of this place um that because we share clergy and clergy from that tradition can celebrate Eucharist here and the like. So it's a very close relationship that we form through lots of different agreements uh, and things. Um, and they also, uh, but there are a lot of other churches that we have some unity with, like we'll read the same, uh, we follow the same lectionary cycle, even if there are other things that we're a little less agreed upon. Um, but anyway, so what we read from scripture, uh, the Revised Common Lectionary, provides, um, I don't know if Kate, did Kate talk at all about lectionary stuff when she talked about scripture with y'all? That's not like a, oh, she should have and she's deficient or something, but just, just wondering. Um, so, you know, on a given Sunday at St. Stephen's, you would at least have a reading from either the Old Testament, from the Hebrew scriptures, like uh, one of the first five books of the Bible, like Genesis, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, or um, a reading from one of the prophets like Isaiah, um, Jeremiah, um, which have different, you know, genres and different uh, emphases. Then we'd also um, have, or we'd either have an Old Testament. So, sorry, Revised Common Lectionary provides four readings for every given Sunday. An Old Testament reading, Hebrew Scripture reading, um, a psalm, a New Testament reading, which would be like a letter from Paul um, or uh, one of the other kind of epistle letter type things, Book of Revelation, Acts of the Apostles, or, and, three, and a, re a gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, the, the, the prayer book actually assumes that all four of those are being read. <laughs> Sometimes... Those of us in larger churches, you know, we're all for scripture. We do have to get to brunch. So. 
I don't think we can read all four. We've got to get to formation hour. So most Episcopal churches now, it's pretty rare that someone reads all four, an Old Testament, a Psalm, a New Testament, and a Gospel. Um, 9, 11, 15 here, we read three of those uh, generally. Um, but the prayer book actually assumes that we're reading all, all of them. Uh, sometimes the psalm is read antiphonally, you know, priest reads, the congregation, back and forth. This coming Sunday, uh, we're doing this once a month now, uh, there's some beautiful settings, sung settings to psalms, like canticles and other prayers for morning prayer that the choir will sing. They're, they're really beautiful in the morning. Um, at the Celtic service, we really only read one reading. You generally, I mean, the gospel, because that's required if you have a Eucharist. There's a different emphasis there, of course, but in the morning, uh, we, we generally read three. So there's, again, an experience of the word, of reading from God's word, reading from the Bible, of coming to know and read Jesus in that scriptural reading, and then the word that's proclaimed, which is through a sermon or a homily, um, and so that's sort of the first part of a service. Then the next part talks about prayers. So this is where the prayers of the people is sort of the form, generally what we call it, which is the opportunity for the community that's assembled to bring to God what's on our or particular hearts. Um, there's a couple forms in the prayer book. If you turn to page 383, if you don't mind, try to tour, us, tour our way through here. So um, the prayers of the people, these different forms, um, are, are, they were really, um, they were made when the 1979 prayer book was made as guides. Like this, this would be, this is, these are some versions of this. But the po important point is, that they want you to say prayers offered with intercession for the next uh, six things. So, you know, it would be kind of silly if we had prayers of the people that only talked about Richmond, Virginia, you know, and St. Stephen's, as if we didn't live in a commonwealth or a country or a world. But if all, but if all we prayed for is, like, cosmic concerns, like, this is a congregation. It's a particular community. So they just want us to sort of hit different points, kind of different altitudes, if you will, of concern. Um, and particularly there always have a, a way for people to pray for those who have died for people who are sick for sure but always recalling folks who have died and you know one of um, Gary Jones my former boss here the rector here's emphases all the time is you know sometimes we like this coming Sunday we're kind of celebrating the culmination or well, sort of culmination of our stewardship campaign. I'm not going to ask for your pledge card tonight, I promise. Uh, but, and as I've said, uh, we'll, we'll get plenty of pledge cards after October 24th. But we're kind of emphasizing gratitude for what God has done and the generosity of this community, which is, which is continuing even in these times. But Gary would always say, don't forget that someone might be in church that day whose mom just died. And if all of the prayers are, thank God for all the blessings of this life and, you know, how kind of triumphalistic, how great we are and how much what we've done, if, if there's never a space for someone who's in the pew who just had something awful happen to them, then that makes them pretty much feel like they don't belong. So there's always an emphasis here where we try to hold out. Um, and this is also true for... Um, Sometimes when those of us who preach, um, so we could have a whole class on, you know, uh, preaching politics from the pulpit, <laughs> popular conversation, um, and the need sometimes to, uh, to address sermons are really just about taking scripture, taking the Bible, and trying to um, interpret them for the world in which we live and the time in which we live. The word is meant to be interpreted um, in the language, understand, understand it by the people. Well, um, if scripture isn't speaking about the peop isn't speaking about things going on in the people's world, that seems to be not keeping the principle. Um, 
But also, if an entire sermon is only about a given thing and doesn't acknowledge that, um, you know, with those of us who preach, we're always um, called to be both priest and prophet. So always sort of a little bit of challenge. The gospel is never comfortable for anyone. Um, but if all you do is challenge, people are exhausted. And what happens to the person whose mom just died? Do you think they want to be challenged by, like, to, you know, sell all they have and give it to the poor? No, because their mom just died. And so you need to contend for, you know, we always say there's two, four, 20 of y'all here uh, and people joining online. If I were to preach, which I guess I'm kind of doing now, um, we always say there are 20 different sermons being preached because everyone has lenses. Everyone has a way in which they um, are understanding those words. And often people, the joke is that people will come up to me or colleagues after church and say, or email, uh, and say, you know, I, Will, when you said blah di blah, blah, blah in your sermon, it just really spoke to me. And I'm pretty sure I didn't say bah, 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 or whatever it was. I didn't say something totally different, but and that's not because they're, you know, losing it and they don't have their hearing. It's because they, the, hurt, the word came to them interpreted in a certain way. Uh, and uh, that's how the Holy Spirit works. The word is proclaimed and people receive it in certain ways. But this is all about sort of having our liturgies be both rooted in the past and in tradition and yet in a language understood by the people in a given context on a given day. And you can't, I mean, we can't, be all things to all people, but we always try to have a mark of what would it be like if I came to this church, or what would it be like if I came to this church and I just had a baby? So it's joyful time. You know, if everyone is, I mean, so even in Lent, there's not zero joy, you know? And even in a time of Thanksgiving, there's not zero room for someone who's in utter pain. Just trying to pastorally be aware of all those dynamics. This is what we, you know, spend our time thinking about here on, our, on the good day when I'm not answering emails and stuff. Uh, it's about these other things. So there's this section here for times of prayer, bringing concerns for the people. And it's really, the prayer book emphasizes that really is assuming that communities are also writing their own prayers um, not just using these as like scriptural one, form one, two, um, three, four, and that's the only versions available. Um, I want us to go back in the prayer book to page um, 359, if you don't mind. So it says, that, again, we just sort of flipped to the specific part of the prayer book. We're now back in the service. Prayers are offered with intercession for bum, bum, bum. Um, so this is, this is always funny. I love this rubric, which is just kind of like uh, rules or instructions that are in the italics. If there is no celebration of the communion, or if a priest is not available, <laughs> it's like we're all at lunch or something, um, this, or, or if you're at a really small church where you can't get a priest, which is common, and just where, this is where St. Stephen's is the gross exception. We have five full-time on staff. Most churches don't even have one full-time. The service is concluded as directed. So this is like if we couldn't have a priest. And I just came from clergy conference at Shrinemont where, um, you know, there are like 180 churches in the Diocese of Virginia, uh, which covers uh, Richmond, uh, the Northern Neck, and then all the way over to Charlottesville. And, the, um, and just Charlottesville, but a little bit past Charlottesville is a different diocese. And then all the way up to Northern Virginia and all of those churches. And there's like, 407 churches in Northern Virginia. They're all like saint. They're not, but there's like a lot in Northern Virginia. Um, and St. Stephen's is the largest. Uh, in, it's in largest in this Commonwealth of Virginia. There are three dioceses in this state, the Commonwealth. Um, but we're the weird one. We have, we're huge, and we have five clergy. But a lot of other churches where one priest serves two different congregations. They're yoked together. And my godmother, who lives in Orange, goes to one where uh, they, 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 both were, they both couldn't afford a priest on their own. So they, they didn't merge, but they share a priest. And one's in Rapidan and one's in Gordonsville. And they both had services at 
like I think 8 and 10 a.m., which how that church had two different services is funny. But again, every church has an 8 a.m. service, even if there's like four people there usually. Um, and so they had, to, they had to figure out who was going to, I mean, the priest can't be at two different places at the same time. So one had to go to 9 o'clock and one had to go to 11. And she may be watching, so I should watch what I say. But um, my godmother, she said, well, I'm, I, she was worshiping at one of them, but then they moved it. They had to be the one to go to 9 o'clock. And the other one in Gordonsville went to 11 o'clock. And she said, well, I have been, she was on the vestry at one of them, but she now goes to the other one because it's at a time that she likes better. It's at 11. And, you know, I mean, it's the country, so it takes time. But, you know, it's just interesting. Whenever, don't change worship times in churches. That can be dangerous. Uh, we, don't, we don't have to do that here, thankfully. Um, but this is just, you know, uh, worshiping in places where sometimes you're not able to have a priest to celebrate the Eucharist. Anyway, it's just a funny side note. So then it talks about uh, confession, um, and which is really sort of the ending part of the prayer, which is, again... Uh, we talked about this last week about while there is a, a right, R-I-T-E, in the prayer book for an individual confession, the, um, the prayer book really assumes that uh, we're corporately acknowledging the ways in which all of us have sinned, have fallen short, have not lived up to the best part of ourselves, uh, which isn't about, again, focusing really on like you know, the scandalous things we've done, but just the ways in which, you know, wasn't my best self today because I cursed that person out on Cary Street or whatever, in, in the car, you know, in traffic or something, or I was uncharitable to someone else, or the ways in which I um, didn't love myself, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. I didn't love myself very well today um, or during the week. Um, so... I think it's, this is one of those areas, again, I thought about what we talked about last week. This is the emphasis where um, I think it's really important for us to keep, stay humble, to acknowledge that all of us fall short of the sort of high loftiness that Jesus calls us to, but that's not meant to be sort of, you know, woeful, uh, I am a worm and no person. Um, but it's when we start thinking that we don't make any mistakes that we're in trouble, uh, I think. Uh, that generally leads to authoritarianism and other not-so-great things. Uh, but this is not about sort of, you know, us feeling bad about ourselves. I think it's about being honest about ourselves and acknowledging that we always are, we are called here to acknowledge that uh, actually, you know, thank God grace is not based on merit or what we've done or not done. And that's really what it is. It's, it's the opportunity to understand every week that we're given the gift of grace that has nothing to do with what we did or didn't do. So it's not, it's not because, oh, well, we'll be perfect and we'll get this thing. No, we're never called to be perfect. I think we're called to be faithful. That's what Jesus calls to do. Follow me. So confession, we have that opportunity. And um, the priest in my, or the bishop, who's rarely here, but says absolution, it's really, you know, not in my magical power invested in me, but uh, in the name of the church, on behalf, uh, the priest is uttering um, forgiveness on all of us, including the, the priest, uh, including the person who's giving it. Then uh, there's the peace. And I wanted to read a little bit from the reading about that. So those of you who might remember a time in the Episcopal Church before 1979, will remember that there was no peace. There was no passing of the peace. Um, and this was uh, a somewhat controversial, I have read early on, uh, part of the service. And that's not just because Episcopalians can be kind of uh, stuffy, maybe, or something. It's not just about cultural stuff, but I think it's just a, a different way of orienting. But this is, I wanted to, to read um, some about the peace. Liturgically, the halfway point of the service is the peace. This is rich in symbolism. It comes just before the offertory, so we're reminded of our Lord's instruction uh, in the Sermon on the Mount that before we make an offering to God, we should ensure that we are at peace with our brother or sister or sibling, I would say. So this is the moment when we symbolically reach out to those we find difficult, 
This is, of course, assuming that the person sitting next to you in the pew is someone that you actually find difficult, which may or not be true, but the symbolism is, is important. This sometimes can become just sort of a, hey, how you doing? And, you know, with pandemic, we can't, we, we're not like, I'm not policing people's hugging, like, don't hug, that's not allowed, or something, or don't shake hands. But generally, people, you know, doing this or something, but the symbolism is a little lost when we can't sort of physically touch or aren't as much. Um, but in the moment of the handshake or whatever it is, we are not simply recognizing the person in front of us as a person with whom we strive to be at peace, but we also reach out to the person who is driving us crazy at work. In addition, we also reach out to the person who hurt us in our past. It is amazing the number of people who are damaging others because they were damaged by a failed relationship or a parent who neglected them. This is where I say, like, hurt people, hurt people, you know. In the peace, we invite the peace of the Lord to heal that pain. We strive to be at peace with all those in the present and past who have hurt us. So that, I just think it's interesting to pause there. Uh, that sometimes is sort of the moment where, you know, there's a little chit-chat and, and we, we say hey and whatever. And hopefully if, we're, um, if we see someone who we maybe haven't seen before, we offer a word of welcome. This is always where I say at churches, you know, because especially in big churches where people go to different services, there have been plenty of people who just randomly went to a different service and have been welcomed. Say, how long have you been? <laughs> Are you new? And you say, I've been here about 20 years. Just go to the other service. <laughs> so it's always a funny part. Be, beware before you assume that someone is actually new. But it's good. The, the sentiment is a good one. But I think it, that's, uh, again, like we started with that prayer about things which are cast down are being raised up things which had grown old are being made new. We all have relationships, parts of ourselves and our lives that have grown old, that are being fed by the fuel of resentment, um, that are um, traumas of our life and experience. And I think the church here is trying to recover a scriptural principle and an ancient principle of the early church that was about reconciling between people. It's a pretty cool model for, I think, our world uh, that needs more of that. Um, and, and acknowledging that Jesus, the wisdom here, Jesus says is, um, you know, I don't need any fancy processions and gifts if you're not, at, um, if you're not reconciled with your neighbor. Uh, because, you know, we can say all day long that we believe in reconciliation and have the pageantry, but if we're not willing to do the work, somehow that's uh, falling on hollow and deaf ears. And the Hebrew scriptures particularly, the prophets are always talking about, you know, I have no need for your dumb idols anymore or your burnt offerings. Prophet Michael, but do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. The human pretensity sometimes to say the right things but not live those out is always the challenge and that's ultimately what we're about uh, in worship. So, um, then the reading talks about how we go into um, sort of the second part of the service, or Holy Communion, different ways of praying, um, different ways of recalling who God is in the salvation story. Some of this has some difference depending on the season. We'd emphasize different things in this part. Um, well, at the last service, we'll, since we'll do, we'll have a service of Holy Eucharist and we'll do that together, I'll, I'll wear whatever the vestments are appropriate for the day, the color, but we'll talk about those, why there are certain things and why we wear this and why colors are green in ordinary time and purple in Advent and white at Christmas and Easter and, um, and you know, at, at other times and seasons and the like. The, um, ultimately, the communion service is recalling who God is for us and then always involves words from Jesus' own mouth on the Last Supper. On the night before he was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks for it. So that's like on page 362. This is just using the first form, like those forms of the prayers of the people, one, two, three, four, A, B, C, D, 
and then there are a lot of others that have been approved that we use in other settings. They all have a pretty similar structure. Um, the first, actually, turn back to 361 if you don't mind. Um, these three bits here about um, the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him or God thanks and praise. That is an ancient form of prayer uh, that actually it, we usually call it by its Latin, sursum corda. Corda, like cardiology, heart, sursum, together, lift. So lift up your hearts. That's, that's what lift up your hearts means in Latin. That's what we call it, the sursum corda, even now, uh, even though no one speaks Latin anymore. Um, I mean, again, not against any classics people here, but most people don't speak Latin. Um, the, uh, and then we, we go through the service. I won't go through all of it, but just some interesting tidbits. So at the bottom of page 362, you'll see uh, this is where the priest, um, standing not like pretending to be Jesus, but Jesus, we always say Jesus is the host of every Eucharistic service. The priest is sort of saying on behalf of the community these words that we say together. You know, in this place, we, especially at the Celtic service, but we use it in the morning too, different forms of the prayers of the people in which these words, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. Those are called the words of institution, the institution of the Eucharist, instituting it, founding it. Um, those are the words Jesus says that the priest says on behalf of the community. We have some forms of the prayers of the people where everyone says those together. There's not, not about some magic trick that the priest only can say these words, but these words are said on behalf of the assembly, and there are sometimes when we emphasize that we all are part of this. The work of the people, not the work of the clergy, is what liturgy is. Um, some, that's, that's hard to emphasize in other churches where that's never said by the people. In some of our worship, we do that here. And that's not because we're some, like, radical, you know, out there people, uh, it, it, it's because the, the, words, the words are the work of the people. They're meant for the people to say. There are certain words that the priest says for different reasons, for things to have be valid and the like. So I'm not trying to under... Uh, I'm not trying to say we... And clergy are not just brought in to say certain things, like make it real. That doesn't really work. But we emphasize different things. I just think it's helpful to talk about that. Um, there's one bit in the reading I want to emphasize. Um, this really, uh, the reading talks about how all of the Eucharistic prayer uh, in the communion service is about finding grace. I think it's a really helpful way to think about it. The gospel claim is that grace is embedded in the hardest of times. It is in the great thanksgiving that we invite God to show us where the grace is to be found. Sometimes it is po impossible to see, but somewhere there will be grace. And this ultimately is acknowledging that this gift of the Eucharist comes on the night before Jesus is betrayed. Well, the night he's betrayed. Um, and that's a sort of wonderful thing. So every time at the Eucharist, even if it's a celebration, we acknowledge that grace is somehow bound up with tragedy, that somehow pain is, is again, a, a part of human life, um, not because God is uh, a marionette player who's screwing with us or something, but because we live in a world in which um, it's not exactly how God would want it or originally created it, and that's in which why we believe Jesus came, in part to show us the way, to show us what love really looks like. Then we receive the Eucharist um, in bread and wine. <laughs> bread, just bread now. Wine will come back. I don't really know when. Be a betting person, but uh, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see. It ain't, ain't going to be tomorrow, but uh, pandemics are doing their thing, but we'll, we'll, we're working on it. Um, and then we have a prayer after communion, which uh, I might have you all turn to page. Uh, here we are. Where would we be? Oh, hold on. Uh, not there. Huh. 
Oh, uh, 365 should show up, yeah. Um, yeah, 365, um, where we would say, there are two forms here that we say a lot. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members. And this is, the reading talks about, this is one prayer for all of us to come back together, saying together, it's not just said by the priest, and really this is what um, equips us for work in the world. This acknowledges that we've received this precious gift, and it's about send us out into the world in peace, have strength and courage, uh, if you turn the page to 366, um, and now, Father, send us out to do the work you've given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses. This is always where I emphasize that, you know, in any given service, in every given pew, in every given church, you've got people who, um, who are really about the work. Like, I want to go and feed the hungry and clothe the naked and work for uh, making unjust structures just. And that has a place that the church is about because we're about what? Um, raising up that which has been cast down and making new that which had been grown old. And we're a church. And we do that because of a particular commitment and a particular desire to walk with Jesus along a certain way. And so sometimes in any given parish, uh, and this is true at St. Stephen's, that there are folks who are like, I, you know, I don't really go to church, but I'm all about outreach. And like, I want to be on the front lines and there and or, and that is commendable and wonderful. Also have people who perhaps are less interested in going outside the walls of the church, really love worship and praying, um, but sometimes get a little sort of, I don't really know how much work there is for me to do out in the world. Um, That's not really my thing. And that's okay, because we need people who are praying on behalf of the world and, and stuff. But both of these folks, like Jesus is speaking to both sides of them, saying, in, in essence, a lot of what clergy do sometimes is inviting these folks to discover the riches of the worship tradition, in essence, to give them fuel for that work, because burnout is real and just kind of getting um, sort of frustrated. And then sometimes it's people over here uh, who need to be reminded that there's a big world out there uh, and a Jesus who calls them uh, to love their enemy and to clothe the naked and to feed the hungry. And he didn't mean metaphorically. He meant metaphorically and literally. And uh, so that we have some people who need to be kind of lovingly pushed out of the nest like a, like a, like a mother bird with chicks. Um, and then we need to invite some people over here uh, who need to be reminded that we're a church about this work. We're not the United Way. We're not uh, the Salvation Army necessarily. We're, we do this from a particular commitment, and not that they should stop what they're doing, but they could take advantage of the riches of liturgical prayer life to sustain them. And those folks talking to each other is a lot of what parish ministry is. And I think it's helpful to say, some of us are at different ends of the spectrum, you know, depending on the week or the month. Um, and that's okay. But all of us, they're both kind of required if we're going to be following Jesus, I think, faithfully. But we all have different roles to play in that. And this is where, you know, living out our baptismal life with following this Jesus um, doesn't have to look like doing something crazy and extraordinary. It could mean uh, being your ministry, all of you, uh, even if you're not ordained, uh, all of us have a ministry because all of us are baptized. All of us are called to respond to uh, what Jesus is calling us to do in the world. And that might mean that you at your you know, office, or you know, if we're not working remotely now, Zoom, that you're, um, you're the hands and feet of Christ to your colleague who's having a hard time uh, or who needs support um, or you're, you're in a corporate board meeting and conversations about, you know, whether we should uh, pay people enough to have a roof over their head come up. You should listen to the voice of Jesus who says, you know, do however you treat the least of these or how you treat me. 
that's a ministry unto its own, which isn't about um, being sort of anti-wealth or anything like that, but it is about um, that there's plenty good room for all God's people. There's plenty good room for everyone to live a life that has abundance. That's what Jesus came to give all of us. And so all of us have a way to work towards that. Um, and all of us have a way to talk about that with people, about what uh, hopefully abundant life you might be finding at St. Stephen's. And not necessarily to get people to come to church so we can like make the pledge campaign. What an awful way to sell anything. But to say, you know, I'm, I'm finding my life enriched here. Maybe you should come and see what that's about. Or what does that look like for you in your given context or church or faith community? Um, so that's a really important part of the service uh, where we're kind of uh, recommitting ourselves to go out into the world. Um, let's see. There's, um, there's a lot more here. It's 7.50. Mm, did it again. Um, are there uh, questions, comments? Challenges, pushbacks. Yeah, Richard. Well, so Richard's pointing out uh, the, the, the $64,000 question. So if it's common prayer, but A, we're not all speaking the same language and there are all these different versions and traditions, is that really common, maybe? Um, and is it essentially the same book? Um, I would say, so there are always, again, there are always sort of essentials that have to be interpreted. So if, if, if a part of the... Uh, Anglican Communion said, you know, we're just going to stop using that Lord's Prayer. We think that's old, not worth it anymore. That would be like a red flag. And I mean, technically, we don't actually have authority to tell like the New Zealanders to stop using the, the Lord's Prayer, um, but it would, it would cause a, a bunch of challenge. Um, but you know, there are, I know there are people, it, it, it all depends on what we define as an essential, right? Because uh, it's what's common um, I think sometimes people have emphasized that common prayer is about um, if, if it's about what's conversant, you know, what makes, what, what is still understood by the people as do we understand that basically these different forms are speaking the same truths? But I think it's a tension. Um, it's a tension point for sure. Uh, I would say they are essentially the same um, but that's always a dynamic tension. Uh, that's for sure. Especially, and this is, of course, this is one of the ways that um, issues of all kinds of things, particularly over the last 15 years, 15 years ago, um, you know, if a cultural context is, is interpreting that they're reading scriptures a certain way that um, honors that... Um, folks who might be same gender oriented, um, that that's blessed. Um, how does that conflict with people who don't, who live in a country who don't recognize that that even exists, that, that you have orientation at all? This is where the heads, it's not just about homophobic people, it's about what's the authority of scripture? What's the authority of the prayer book? Um, what's the role of the church in being, uh, blessing certain relationships over here in the world where you still could go to jail if you're gay over here. That, that, that's pretty tough. And that's been the source of some tension. Um, that, and this is about how we read scripture around women's authority. So if women, uh, if you read certain parts of scripture that they, they're not supposed to, supposed to be silent and listen to their husbands, uh, well, hard to have women bishops. Well, you don't believe that over here. If the language understand by the people there you do, that, that leads to some tension points. Now that's, of course, as I think I mentioned a couple weeks ago, getting tough because some pretty conservative parts of African Anglican churches have started ordaining women as bishops. 
And so now there are conservative folks in other parts of the world who used to have folks there as allies. Now there's some conflict there. So I think it's, I would say on the prayer book point, it's, it's basically the same, but it's always a tension point for sure. Yeah. Any others? Hot topics. Um, the uh, next week we're talking about um, the church and the alien communion. Well, that that's good timing. We'll talk about that next time. Um, because I because I, I know some people have have really enjoyed it, and we I like to generally keep a pattern. Um, let's let's go. Let's end with Compline. We'll we'll probably get right at eight o'clock with the stuff, so it's um, page 127. And I'll again lead us through this. So I invite you just to take a brief moment to take a couple deep breaths and um, invite God to be with us in this uh, bedtime prayers of the church. The Almighty and merciful, the Almighty, the Lord Almighty, grant us a peaceful night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all our offenses and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Let us say together Psalm 31 on page 129. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to deliver me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. For you are my crag and my stronghold. For the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that they have secretly set for me, for you are my tower of strength. Into your hands I commend my spirit, for you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. We say together on 131, glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thanks be to God. Turning the page. <coughs> Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Keep us, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Look down, O Lord, from your heavenly throne, and illumine this night with your celestial brightness, that by night as by day your people may glorify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Saying together, Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering. Pity the afflicted. Shield the joyous. And all for your love's sake. Amen. In the spirit of our conversation this evening, I now invite you to offer your own prayers of intercession and thanksgiving either silently or aloud. Pray for Claire, who has died. For David. conclude by saying the song of Simeon together. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may have rest in peace. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised, for these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see, a light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ and asleep we may rest in peace. Let us bless the Lord. The Almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. So you all notice that the, what I read from the New Zealand prayer book, that's in night prayer. Praise be to God, I have lived to see this day. God's promise is fulfilled and my duty done. At last you have given us peace, for we have seen with our own eyes the salvation you have prepared for all nations, a light to the world in its darkness and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to God, sustaining, redeeming, sanctifying, as in the beginning, so now, and forever. Amen. Thank you all.